So after two talks about um, uh, on central serous retinopathy, and I'm going to cover uh, micropulse for diabetic macular edema. I don't know how many of you that you spend quite a lot of time in the U.S. and I, I unfortunately that do need to spend quite a lot of time in the U.S. listening to people saying that we never laser in the U.S. anymore, so no point to uh, do laser anymore, and no point to worry about laser anymore. And in fact, actually, some of my friends in laser business actually told me that you know, should they actually think about finding another job as such. So, so I think I wanted to start to try to show you a few things first of all. I, um, this is my financial disclosure, as I uh, mentioned earlier. So just to say, well, is there a role of laser in the anti veg era for diabetic macular edema? So I think that what we highlight is something is that was presented uh, is protocol T. And some of you actually probably heard uh, Neil Bresner talking about it uh, yesterday. And again, I'm not going to bore you the fine detail, but just to tell you that this study was done during the last couple of years. So not that long ago, and anti VEGF is already available at that point. It's comparing the three different type of anti VEGF. Well, it depends on how you see it. So if you think about almost 35 to 40% of patients that even joining this study are still already have laser, then you wouldn't say that um, not a lot of people have laser and no one laser in the US anymore. So 40, 30% is quite a large number. And as you can see here, and then they need to give about nine to 10 injection. And again, you know, that is quite a lot of injection. And then you would have thought that if you are not allowed to laser anyone in the first six months, that is study protocol, and then have around six injection. I think Neil mentioned yesterday that 95% of the patient actually have six injection, right? And then you would have four. So he said that only a small number of patients have laser. Well, I wouldn't call 30%, 37% using a few percent, which is the best result uh, among that group, are, are small. And certainly wouldn't say 56% if you're using a Vastin is a small number when you're using so 10 injection of a Vastin in the, just the first year. Therefore, when you're actually seeing that protocol I, 90%, more than 90% of the patient had laser by the end of the five years follow up. So when you say 90% of patients have laser and we don't laser anyone, I'm not quite sure that who've been doing it. So take you back to the European study, the restore study I was involved in in the past. Again, I don't want to bore you the fine detail about all these things, but just to take, take one quick point is that when you've got a very, very thick retina, there's no doubt Lucentis or anti vegf in general do very well. So don't, don't think that you know, we don't appreciate the benefit of anti vegf However, then when, you are using, when, you, the, when the thick retina is less thick, then the picture is quite different. And even in the middle group, then you would need to argue that if you are doing a lot of injection, that there might be a separation. But if you are not doing as many, in the real life that we have seen that in a numinous study that in real life the number of injection is much lower in Europe, Europe than you would expect in a clinical trial and then you will think that the separation might be much closer. So there's no doubt anti job is useful when the retina is thick. Looking at it, another slide, this is quite un unscientific. I have to declare that first because I think for clinical trialers, we will need to think about this thing in more detail. This is just an indication rather than a scientific fact. When you divide the group that you have pyre laser and no pyre laser, you can actually then see that in those who have laser before, then Lucentis appears to be doing better. Not statistically significant, but at least it's numerically better. But that the better in mind, however, that if the patient have laser before and still need to join the trial, they are laser failure. Because anyone that who have been treated by laser and did well would not need to join the trial because they would have been sorted, right? So therefore, that if you're selecting a group of patients that will already fail laser and then go in to do more laser might not make much difference. So that might explain why Lucentis on its own appears to be better because the laser might cause more damage. On the other hand, when those who have never had laser before, as you can see, the combination do slightly better. That might be related to the fact that you can absorb the edema a little bit quicker, and so on and so forth. But again, this is not very scientific, but just to give you a favor that it's not wrong to start laser if you wanted to. I think that is probably the more the message. So laser is little in most cases, despite even for people who say that they don't do laser anymore, 
However, that is, can we improve the way we do laser? So what I have said so far, everything that I said so far was on conventional laser. So this is not what we're talking about. So could we actually move on and do better? And obviously, when you come to this symposium, we assume that you're interested to actually to do better. And obviously, micropulse is one of the ways to do that. And again, this, is a, from, this case is from something that we have published very, a, a long time ago with microaneurysm and with uh, the leaking microaneurysm OCT changes. And if you had laser uh, on this area, we only carry out one laser treatment and then um, you know, without any uh, further laser treatment at 12 months, and then the edema disappear with the equivalent improvement of, micro, uh, of, laser, uh, of uh, OCT. Some people also ask us how close can we go. Now again, with the screening program in the UK, we're starting to see a little bit more of these kind of cases. We have a little bit of edema right in the middle, and you've got a, a OCT changes, just a little bit, a little bubbles uh, in, the, in the macula. And again, in general, we don't tend to treat them, but, uh, but then usually then they get over time, they get to get, gradually get worse. But if you do micro, if you look at the angiogram, the microaneurysm which is very, very close to the fovea. And in fact, there probably no one who will consider doing conventional laser in these kind of cases. And indeed, when I show this case in the US, virtually 100% of, uh, of the audience will go for uh, injection which is absolutely not wrong. So that, don't think that that is wrong. That is not wrong, right? However, that, you know, we will be able to do that with micropulse, and obviously that we are showing you the cases that we will be able to do that with micropulse. And you can actually see that the uh, benefit of those cases. This case is not to say that this is a big problem. This is not a big problem. In the screening program, we do pick them up, but it's not a very common thing. But this is just to illustrate that we can get extremely close to the fovea and staff and it's still very safe to do. So that is more than actually that you get, you need to sort out the problem and this is not a major problem. This is really to show how close that can we go to do that. What about follow up? Well, the way that we tend to do it is that, you know, if you've got a large area of edema and if you think about that, um, you know, um, when you've got a large area of edema, you, you probably need more than one treatment. The one that I showed you had a quite a small area of edema. You might be able to get away with just uh, one single treatment. But what we normally do is we, follow, we bring them back in three months' time, and then we retreat any persistent area of edema. We're using the same protocol. We don't change the protocol, and then the treatment is OCT guided. In other words, is that when you were treated before, uh, we then we treated, uh, we treated over the same area, which is still persistent edema. When we treated before, that we, for us, we're using the Heidelberg, and then um, you will basically treat on the uh, OCT map all the red and white area, and then uh, that is basically that become our treatment map to a certain extent. And then if there is some reduction of edema, um, but then you would then go, go on and retreat the area of edema. If you've got small area of edema, and again, we have quite confident that when you've got small area of edema, they work very well. So instead of no point wasting time to bring them back at three months, and quite often then we bring them back at six months. So that is a, something that you can um, decide on your own as such. I have put out a few uh, frequently asked questions because a lot of people would, after the conference, after the meeting, or sometimes they will ask us some question about that. So because one of my colleagues in uh, America uh, have presented a paper it's first in Toronto and then obviously in this meeting as well that you know uh, we can treat the fovea, the so-called chance fovea treatment. To be fair, you know that uh, yes, you can treat the fovea, but I tend not to do it. But, to be, but also that if I already told you that we treat up to 100 micron. So what I do different from Jeff is that, that we don't shoot at the fovea directly, deliberately. And that is only one spot different. So to a certain extent, if you want to, please go ahead and certainly seems to be absolutely fine. But then we don't have a habit of deliberately hitting the fovea. And to be fair, just one spot of laser, I don't think is here or there that to actually whether that affecting our, our, our treatment benefit or not. How many times can we retreat? Well, we have done it three times uh, in, quite, in some patient, but to be fair, one, by the time that you get to three times, it worked most of the time by then, so we don't tend to need to retreat it unless that you make the wrong diagnosis or there is other issue that actually you miss out. And there is some suggestion that they do let work less well in retinal vein occlusion. 
So if you've got a diabetic macular edema patient, but might be because diabetic patient also have vein occlusion, which is not uncommon, and certainly something to think about, that if you do have a case that it doesn't seem to respond to micro pulse and can have a think whether that could be a vein occlusion or not. And I have to say that vein occlusion is sometimes work, but they do less work less well with micro pulse. And so it's something that to think about from that perspective. Certainly, some other group, Jeff and Equados, they have also treated a patient more than three times, that I was told. And as long as you don't see any scarring, you can keep going if you wanted to. But to be fair, quite often, by after treating three times, you probably want to do something else, either injection or otherwise. So something to think about. Is it better than anti Jeff? Well, yes, it's better because it probably lasts longer when you get, you get it sorted out and probably cheaper. However, that it does not work as quickly. So anti jab work very quickly. And so in other words, is that you know, when we should not really think, and certainly as a physician, I don't think that we don't do something. It's actually that when you've got two things that is available to us, and actually using, join, joining them com uh, together, and then it's actually very, a, a very sensible thing to do. As I mentioned earlier, when you've got a thick retina, there's no reason why not that you start with anti jab first and then that to consider putting laser in to actually to maintain the treatment and then reducing the frequency of treatment. So there is a kind of lot of work I still need to uh, define exactly how that we're actually going to apply micropulse when we already started anti therapy. But for those, who, for those edema which is still outside, you not usually inject those patients, then micropulse laser will probably be your automatically first choice because you do not want to scar the retina and, and scarring the retina and potentially cause more, more problem. Again, also put up a few slides about that, um, you know, on, on new micropulse user. I still remember that uh, there was one, uh, one, one doctor come up to me after the, the, the one of the symposium. This, he said to me that, you know, I have this patient that I try a micropulse, it doesn't work. And so I asked him, well, well, what kind of patient is this? Oh, this patient had 22 anti VEGF injection, Avastin, had steroid, and then now I've done a vitrectomy, and uh, it still didn't work, and then now I try micropulse. Right? So if that was the patient that you think is a good case, then, well, that is not a good case, right? I don't know what's wrong with the patient, really, to be fair, but again, you know, if you have 20 anti VEGF, you know, steroid, vitrectomy, and then you try Michael Powell's, then probably Michael Powell doesn't work either. Right? So you need to think about it, is you need to pick your case quite, in, quite, uh, quite carefully. And also that, you know, we need to think about it, the Michael Powell's work is by stimulating the RPE cell. If you had a lot of heavy laser already, when you got a lot of dead cell already, then Michael, then Michael Powell's is also less likely to work. And indeed, that there might be a suggestion, again, I emphasize the suggestion, that, um, that you might actually want to laser the area which looks normal and to get the stimulation of those RPE cells and then to might actually work. And in fact, that uh, some people do suggest that if you've got an area of heavy laser, then you might actually want to treat the normal area. Now, I'm not done that myself, but it's just a hypothetical discussion at the moment, because if we think that this is all a diffuse factor, then that might be something that to think about. However, the key point is from a clinical perspective and also from a biological perspective, if you've got a lot of scar, then a lot of dead cell, then you might not have enough dead, uh, surviving cell to make the micropulse to work. As, I, as Sasha mentioned earlier as well, is most surgeons, when they first Come to, when we first um, do micropulse, they under treat. And in fact, that, you know, some of my fellows who come to my team, they, most of them that come to my team is already experienced laser surgeon. And then some of them think this doesn't work. And then actually, when I look back over the years, we, what we discover is that they under treat. And we already mentioned earlier that you know, quite often that we didn't think about that we need that large number of sports. And sometimes that when you need to do 2,000 sports on the macula, you suddenly don't think that it sound, doesn't sound right. You know, so I think that is something that you need to bear in mind. To be fair, if you're using our protocol, if you're using 160 micron, I don't want to bore you the fine detail of the calculation, that if you've got one this area of edema, you need about 100 spots. 
So in the, when you first start doing micro pulse, it's quite useful to go and look at your OCT map and to figure out roughly how big the edema area is. And if you, the edema area is might be three or four, uh, let's say four, this area. And if you only done 200 spots, then you're probably not going to work and it's probably under treatment. You're probably looking at around 400 spots, then it's in the ballpark, you're roughly right. So I think that's a useful thing to think about to make sure that you, you, um, you look at that. Similarly, with titrating power, again, um, with the company, we're trying to improve the protocol or improve the machine to actually get the titration a little bit easier for you to do. Titrating power is quite often is a problem that some people do tend to pick the power slightly too high, and then they do a little bit of scar, they see a little bit of scarring. So when you're first starting doing micro pulse, it's actually useful to audit your own result. And you, if you've got autofluorescent imaging, you'll be useful to look at autofluorescent imaging, whether they see any scarring there. You should not have scarring. If you see scarring, not panic, but you probably think that you might need to titrate the power even slightly lower because the so-called just visible might be different from individual to individual. So that is something that we've seen that some patients, some, some doctors come back to us and say, yeah, you work, but then I see scarring. Well, not a two, and then the scarring only visible on infrared and autofluorescent imaging, but if you do see scarring, then you might need to titrate your power a little bit lower on your future patient. We certainly they have able to using this current protocol with the with the adjustment of the titration, then we will not see scarring but have biological effect. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>